It's a building filled with people who are being treated for mental illness. I, I don't want people to forget that this is a mental health problem. I don't want them to forget that because it is. It's a mental health problem. Mr. President, two months ago, Texans were mourning the loss of 22 of our people killed in a senseless attack in El Paso, Texas. Little did we know that we were just days away from another violent attack, this time in Midland and Odessa, that took seven lives. Visiting these communities in the wake of these tragedies is tough, something I've unfortunately had experience with following the 2017 shooting at Sutherland Springs and again in 2018 at Santa Fe High School. There are no words to bring comfort to the families and the friends and the community members who were shaken to their very core by these sudden and unwarranted acts of violence. But as I visited with the families and offered my condolences following each of these attacks, there was one common refrain, one common request. Please do something. Today I'm introducing the restoring, enhancing, enhancing, strengthening, and promoting our nation's safety efforts, or the Response Act, as we call it. The second major piece of this legislation improves the quality and ability, availability of mental health care. When I asked the Odessa police chief following the shooting in Midland, Odessa, what is it that you think we might have been able to do? He said, well, we need better access to mental health diagnosis and treatment. It's a building filled with people who are being treated for mental illness. Of course, it's a concern. It was the major investigation that was launched after a deputy claimed to have been shot by a sniper. But authorities say it was all a hoax and he made it up. Now this guy has come forward to say he was questioned by police before the truth came out. This was the urgent scene as armed deputies were on the hunt for a sniper. Deputies ambushed, one shot right outside the Lancaster Sheriff Station. A deputy sheriff in Lancaster, California, claimed a sniper shot him as he walked out of the sheriff station. The sniper was supposedly firing from this apartment building. I think it's from the apartment window. There's multiple windows open. Now, in a dramatic twist, officials say it was a hoax. There was no sniper, no shots fired, and no gunshot injuries completely fabricated. But wait a minute. The mayor of Lancaster said he saw Renos in the hospital, quote, obviously in a lot of pain 20 minutes after the shooting. But the mayor says it was very difficult to go and meet that deputy, see him in so much pain. He's a young deputy, um, a rookie, and the fact that he was shot in the chest was uh, very troubling to him. Take a listen as to what he had to say. Fortunately, he was wearing a vest. The vest saved his life, but the bullet did deflect into his shoulder. Uh, I saw him at the emergency room probably within 20 minutes of the event. I saw him at the emergency room probably within 20 minutes of the event. Officers descended in full SWAT gear, locking down this apartment building and a nearby school for hours. Deputy Reynosa was rushed to the hospital. He fortunately was wearing a vest. The vest saved his life, but the bullet did deflect into his shoulder. The only thing, there was no wound. There was no shooter. Turns out the deputy made the whole thing up. The reported sniper assault was fabricated by our deputy. In an unprecedented late night news conference, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department said Reynosa eventually confessed the two bullet holes in his uniform. He had caused the holes in his uniform shirt by cutting it with a knife. There was no sniper, no shots fired, completely fabricated. Police are searching for a gunman who shot and wounded a sheriff's deputy. Our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, is on the scene in Lancaster. Good morning, Matt. Hey, good morning, George. Sheriff's deputies are still investigating that scene behind me. And just a few moments ago, we spoke to a pair of investigators who told us that the sniper who fired at least one or two shots towards that rookie officer from a building just on the other side of this parking lot that houses mentally ill patients is still on the loose.
That urgent manhunt underway this morning after a sniper opened fire on this Los Angeles County Sheriff's Station, shooting a deputy who was walking through the parking lot on the way to his car. Uh, take a shot from the north of the Lancaster Hill Pass. Uh, see him here in the right shoulder. They might have dropped over from the apartment complex to the north. Yeah, two shots around. That's the rookie deputy calling for help. Hundreds forced to shelter in place as police stormed this nearby four-story apartment complex where it's believed the shots originated. Think about what happened here today. A sniper took out one of our deputies. And the only reason that deputy is alive is because he had his vest on. Residents say police are a regular presence at this building. They let people actually live in our apartment complex with has mental illness. And it's kind of scary because there's no security. The cops are in there constantly. A suspect has yet to be named and no motive has been given. The wounded deputy identified as 21-year-old rookie Angel Reynosa. That bullet hitting his vest and injuring his shoulder, he was rushed to the hospital breathing and conscious. He's been treated and we expect that he'll be fine. Now we're told that that deputy, that rookie, was just about to take that vest off when he was shot. We're told that ballistic vest likely saved his life. He is now, we're told, resting with his family. Robin. Full recovery. So thankful that he had that vest on, Matt. Thank you so much. Our bill would use holistic assessments of experts across a range of fields. Teachers, mental health professionals, mental health professionals, mental health professionals. It's a building filled with people who are being treated for mental illness. I, I don't want people to forget that this is a mental health problem. I don't want them to forget that because it is. It's a mental health problem. Mental illness and hatred pulls the trigger. Not the gun. I actually live in our common complex with has mental illness. But people have to remember, however, that there is a mental illness problem that has to be dealt with. It's not the gun that pulls the trigger. It's the person holding the gun. Years ago, many cities and states, I remember it so well, closed mental institutions for budgetary reasons. They let those people out onto the street. You probably have your examples up here. I can tell you in New York, they closed so many of them, and they let really seriously mentally ill people out on the streets. And you see plenty of them today, even today, we're going to have to give major consideration to building new facilities for those in need. We have to do it. There are many well-documented camps and prisons that have sprung up around the United States the past decade or so. Currently, the largest of these facilities is just outside Fairbanks, Alaska. The Alaskan facility is a massive mental health camp and can hold approximately 2 million people. FBI and Homeland Security documents classify homeschoolers, gun rights activists, some veterans, and anti-abortionists as threats against the existing social and political order, by default creating an entire nation of radicals and revolutionaries where everyone is a suspect, equally guilty until proven otherwise. And what is the solution to deal with these people? The same way as every other totalitarian regime throughout history, marginalize their activities, then lock them up. When I asked the Odessa police chief following the shooting in Midland, Odessa, what is it that you think we might have been able to, to do? He said, well, we need better access to mental health diagnosis and treatment. So we clearly need to do more to identify and support struggling individuals who could pose a danger to themselves and to others. But there is so much more that we have to do and make sure those people not only get treatment, but when necessary, involuntary confinement. Mental illness and hatred pulls the trigger, not the gun. Involuntary confinement. Thank you.
Some among them were potentially dangerous. Most were loyal. But no one knew what would happen among this concentrated population if Japanese forces should try to invade our shores. Military authorities therefore determined that all of them, citizens and aliens alike, would have to move. This picture tells how the mass migration was accomplished. Evacuation. More than 100,000 men, women, and children, all of Japanese ancestry, removed from their homes in the Pacific Coast states to wartime communities established in out-of-the-way places. Their evacuation did not imply individual disloyalty, but was ordered to reduce a military hazard at a time when danger of invasion was great. Two-thirds of the evacuees are American citizens by right of birth. The rest are their Japanese-born parents and grandparents. They are not under suspicion. They are not prisoners. They are not internees. They are merely dislocated people, the unwounded casualties of war. The relocation centers are supervised by the War Relocation Authority, which assumed responsibility for the people after they had been evacuated and cared for temporarily by the Army. A relocation center, housing from 7 to 18,000 people, the entire community bounded by a wire fence and guarded by military police, symbols of the military nature of the evacuation. Each family, upon arrival at a relocation center, was assigned to a single room compartment, about 20 by 25 feet. Barren, unattractive. A stove, a light bulb, cots, mattresses, and blankets. Those were the things provided by the government. In 1942, the United States government forcibly relocated over 112,000 Japanese nationals and Japanese Americans to remote housing facilities called war relocation camps for the purpose of detainment, re-education, and forced labor. Of those interned, 62% were United States citizens. President Franklin Roosevelt authorized the internment with Executive Order 9066 allowing military commanders to designate military areas as exclusion zones. This power was then used to declare the entire Pacific coast as an exclusion zone, forbidding people of Japanese descent to live within these areas, unless, of course, they were held in war relocation camps. In 1944, the Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of these exclusion zones, and in 1945, after two and a half long years of imprisonment, the interns were finally released. The United States government issued no formal apologies, but did present each former inmate with exactly $25 in cash and a train ticket home, if they were lucky enough to still have one. 43 years later, in 1988, President Ronald Reagan would sign a bill that formally apologized for the internment of Japanese Americans on behalf of the United States government and finally granted reparations to survivors. The language of the bill stated that government actions of the 1940s internments were based upon three criteria, racial prejudice, wartime hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. So what is most important in this bill has less to do with property than with honor. For here, we admit a wrong. Here, we reaffirm our commitment as a nation to equal justice under the law. In 2001, following the attacks of September the 11th, our government again went into open roundup mode, detaining and imprisoning thousands of United States citizens again seemingly based upon the same three criteria used to intern Japanese Americans. Race prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. Let there be no argument. The United States government has put its own citizens in detention centers. The justifications for doing so range from personal prejudices based upon political and religious grounds to wartime frenzies and fears of future terrorist attacks. In a time of great crisis, the impossible becomes possible. Is it possible that internment camps are being built in the United States today? 
Is it possible that history will repeat itself? And it is stunning particularly to hear President Obama claim the power to keep people in prison indefinitely with no charges against them, no conviction, no sentence, just imprisonment. Well, we used internment camps here in the United States during World War II, uh, and we interned Japanese Americans. Uh, or Americans, I should say, to be more correct, uh, Americans of Japanese descent. And these people were cordoned off for the duration of the war. Uh, background checks could have been done, they could have been released or cleared out of those facilities, uh, but it was thought best because there was so much animosity toward the Japanese for the attack on Pearl Harbor and subsequent deaths of U.S. soldiers that these people just be kept uh, uh, out of sight in one of their detention facilities. On April 1st, 1979, by Presidential Executive Order 12127, the Federal Emergency Management Agency was created for the purpose of coordinating the response to disasters that have occurred in the United States and that overwhelm the resources of local and state authorities. Upon its creation, FEMA absorbed the Federal Insurance Administration, the National Fire Prevention and Control Administration, the National Weather Service Community Preparedness Program, as well as several other federal level preparedness programs. FEMA was also given the responsibility for overseeing the United States Civil Defense, a function which had previously been performed by the DOD's Defense Civil Preparedness Agency. In 2003, FEMA became part of the Department of Homeland Security's Emergency Preparedness and Response Directorate. FEMA follows three simple directives. One, national emergency recovery. Two, continuity of government. And three, combating perceived threats to the existing social and political order. FEMA's implicit objective to provide aid to victims of disasters changed under the leadership of President George W. Bush. Although some may argue, prior to the Bush administration, FEMA's reaction time for responding to and the handling of national emergencies was beginning to improve. But in 2003, President Bush would shift the focus of responding to emergencies in America by placing FEMA under the umbrella of the Department of Homeland Security, whose stated objective was and still is to protect our nation from dangerous people. Did the Bush administration's war on terror mentality take priority over the government's emergency response to provide aid to victims during a national disaster? We're fighting evil. And I remember my first words to him were, Mr. President, my estimate is that 90%, 90% of the population of New Orleans has now been displaced. 90%? Yes, sir, I believe it is that bad. That's how bad it is. I really thought that would get just the whole mechanism of the federal government to come charging in. Is once again this mentality that it's a natural disaster. It's a hurricane. It's not Al-Qaeda. The most important job of government is to protect the homeland. In the midst of a searing heat wave, Jefferson County residents lined up in their cars for food and water, wondering what took so long. Slow, slow. Everything is slow. The man who runs the county, Judge Carl Griffith, agrees. And in a meeting with President Bush this morning, said FEMA's delivery of relief supplies was unacceptably slow. 
To save American lives, we must be able to act fast. The real distrust of the federal government, especially with the levy system, because now the Army Corps has pushed that date back now to 2011. It was supposed to be up by 2010. As requests for emergency assistance poured in after Hurricane Katrina, one applicant listed this as his address, the Greenwood Cemetery in New Orleans. FEMA promptly issued a check for $2,358 for rental assistance. That's just one of thousands of examples of alleged fraud and abuse described in a new report by the investigative arm of Congress cost to taxpayers about one billion dollars. The examples are so egregious that what they tell us is that FEMA didn't perform even basic checks to safeguard taxpayers money. Well today the outrage spread to Congress where House members accused FEMA of a cover-up. Two years after Katrina, 76,000 FEMA trailers are still being used to house families who lost their homes. Many of the trailers have high levels of formaldehyde, which can result in dangerous respiratory problems. Three of my children began having severe nosebleeds several times a week. Uh, it got so bad that this past Tuesday I actually had to go to the emergency room. Several deaths may well be linked to toxic levels of formaldehyde gas. It is a sick organization. Uh, and it has totally lost the confidence of the people of America. Overnight, FEMA decided to stop issuing debit cards at Houston shelters, but almost no one there hoping for a card had any idea. Pile everybody up in a van and come up here and we can't even get what they said we was going to get. Even Houston's relief coordinators told FEMA a heads up would have been helpful. We just were make sure everyone understood that every time they change their mind in Washington, D.C., it affects people here that are trying to deal with tens of thousands of people. We're talking about damage from Hurricane Rita last year, two devastated schools and kids and parents waiting for help. A few months ago, the folks at FEMA told the schools, one in Iberia Parish and one in Vermilion Parish in Louisiana, that they would get millions to relocate to higher ground. FEMA even helped them draw up the plan. And then... FEMA took it back. Endless delays, he says, caused by FEMA, which just last week delayed money for rebuilding yet again. They're more worried about their own positions in FEMA, their own salaries, than, than the recovery process down here. There is a new hitch to report about those infamous FEMA trailers. After spending nearly three billion taxpayer dollars to buy them, it turned out many went unused, and now FEMA is unloading them at bargain basement prices while other people need them. After a lengthy investigation, the congressional architects of the Department of Homeland Security concluded today that FEMA, the agency that is supposed to respond to hurricanes and national disasters, should be taken out of the mammoth Homeland Security bureaucracy disbanded then put back together in a better way and placed under direct control of the president during emergencies. A Senate report on the government's response to Hurricane Katrina says FEMA is so far beyond repair that the agency should be scrapped. It said that agency failed in its view to anticipate and then respond to Katrina. FEMA is discredited, demoralized, and dysfunctional. FEMA is discredited, demoralized and dysfunctional. In the mid-1970s, the discredited federal government was more scared of the public than ever, coming off the years of Richard Nixon. And so two cold warriors inside the White House of Gerald Ford uh, began to bring back some of the Cold War ideas of an executive takeover uh, of the United States through a uh, emergency federal agency. And those individuals were Donald Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney. And so really what we see being set up by Jimmy Carter in 1979 is just a continuation of federal policy to expand uh, a federal takeover plan for continuity of government. And so that's what the Federal Emergency Management Agency uh, was really set up for. Colonel North, in your work at the uh, NSC, 
Were you not assigned at one time to work on plans for the continuity of government in the event of a major disaster? Mr. Chairman. I believe that question touches upon a highly sensitive and classified area. So may I request that you not touch upon that, sir? One of the programs that got exposed during Iran-Contra was Rex 84. And Congressman Jack Brooks, in those hearings, brought up the fact that, uh, in reality, FEMA was a cover for a huge continuity of government program in case the American people ever rebelled. And that was the architecture or the blueprint uh, for the illegitimate shadow government to fully take over the functions of the entire federal government, suspend the Constitution, suspend the Bill of Rights, and arrest whoever they wanted to. And uh, FEMA was going to uh, control the camps that the people were going to be put into. And FEMA would be the main governmental institution uh, with different directors over every agency. And now when you watch FEMA on television, it's always a colonel or a general or an admiral in uniform who's over the different departments. The martial law portions of Rex 84 were outlined in a 1982 memo written by FEMA Deputy John Brinkerhoff. Martial law was to be declared in the event of a national crisis, yet the plan did not define the term national crisis. The plan allowed FEMA to take control of both federal and state governments, appointing military commanders to replace duly elected officials. The plan also called for the rounding up of at least 21 million American Negroes for delivery to numerous military bases converted into prison centers, also known as FEMA relocation camps. Why? Because at that time, African Americans were classified as one of the largest threats to the continuity of the federal government. Who does the federal government consider the biggest threat these days? The convergence of globalization and technology has created a new brand of terrorism. There were persons who, for whatever reason, came to view their home country as the enemy. The kind of right-wing, religious-based domestic terrorism. Disturbing news tonight about homegrown terror. Part of this is a big change in the White House, a new cultural experience, and some of the crazies are coming out of their closet. Right now, it looks like there is no connection between the men arrested and any known terrorist cell. Homegrown. Uh, yeah, homegrown, I should say. Uh, folks, we've got a very serious situation here. I'm holding what is called the right-wing extremism, current economic and political climate, fueling resurgence and radicalization and recruitment. And in it, we talked about the fact that they define pro-lifers as domestic terrorists. They put this in a Department of Homeland Security uh, document. This in the aftermath of a weekend of mass shootings, the U.S. government is stepping up its security efforts. The public is being encouraged to report any suspicious activity. Furthermore, the Homeland Security Chair is saying he needs monthly briefings from the FBI on domestic terrorism issues. Trump says that he's giving maximum authority to security agencies. Federal authorities are on the ground, and I have directed them to provide any and all assistance required, whatever is needed. Trump also called for social media to step up and cooperate with law enforcement. I am directing the Department of Justice to work in partisan partnership with local, state, and federal agencies, as well as social media companies to develop tools that can detect mass shooters before they strike. More surveillance online is supposed to mean more security offline. Does any of that sound familiar? After 9-11, the Bush administration launched a broad, sweeping surveillance program. The NSA collected data on millions of Americans. We now know about it thanks to Edward Snowden's leaks in 2013. Now, there was certainly outrage, but some said it was necessary to keep us safe. But did it really keep us safe? Not really. We are aware of no instance in which the program directly contributed to the discovery of a previously unknown terrorist plot or the disruption of a terrorist attack. Now, the surveillance program was part of the Patriot Act, a law that allowed for surveillance of terrorism-related suspects and delayed notification of warrants so that suspects wouldn't know that they were being watched. 
Now, the law also lifted territorial restrictions on warrants. It enhanced the penalties and lifted the statute of limitations on terrorism-related crimes. Now the FBI wants to declare acts of violence as domestic terrorism as well. Acts of violence intended to intimidate civilian populations or to influence or affect government policy should be prosecuted as domestic terrorism, regardless of the ideology behind them. The FBI Agents Association continues to urge Congress to make domestic terrorism a federal crime. This would ensure that FBI agents and prosecutors have the best tools to fight domestic terrorism. This is a terrible idea, a simply horrible idea, because it accomplishes nothing after the fact, other than to have um, the, uh, the federal government on board as looking for ordinary Americans as terrorists as they relate to, uh, to criminals who perform terrible crimes. So if you can say that for perhaps the El Paso shooter uh, belonged to certain groups, then you could by extension uh, reach terrorism label to those groups and then to the people of those groups and to the family of the people of those groups. And all of a sudden you've managed to have all of your political enemies on a list to go to jail. Uh, this is the Chicago way of doing business, controlling all methods of law enforcement and prosecution and, and judging so that you can reward your friends and punish your enemies. So this is not surprising. So it would seem we still have the same question, privacy or security? In an article released yesterday, it was revealed that the FBI now considers people who believe in Pizzagate and other various conspiracy theories as domestic terrorist threats. If we are such horrible people for believing in these things that have ample evidence to back it up, then ask yourself, what does that make the CIA? You will not lie, cheat, or steal or tolerate those who do. I, I, I was the CIA director. We lied, we cheated, we steal, stole. It's like we, we, had, we had entire we had entire training courses. Uh, it, uh, it, it it reminds you of the uh, uh, the glory of the American experiment. It boils down to this: you could lead a herd of sheep to water, but you can't make them all drink it.